definition of critical is not approving. They need to find fault with somebody or something. And uh, we know it very well when we say, oh, I don't get too critical with me and so on. And this is a great preconception, mistaken opinion about critical design. Great many people think that uh, this is a design aimed at finding fault in other ways of designing or in the work of other design professionals. Whereas in reality, critical design is much more related to the second and the third definition of uh, the word. If we look, in fact, at the second definition, uh, giving comments or judgments, giving comments and opinions that analyze or judge something in a detailed way, such as, for example, a critical analysis of modern theory, we would realize suddenly that this is, in fact, the essence of our role as designers. As uh, you know, in many previous uh, lectures by Clive and the others concerned, that uh, confirm that indeed our role in the 21st century is to give this uh, detailed comments and opinions about the state of things in the world. And uh, the third definition is uh, uh, especially curious because critical is also pertains uh, uh, pertains to the state of things in the world. Critical also means crucial, such as the decision was a critical one for the country. And indeed, uh, the situation in our world is critical right now. Uh, it is urgent situation with our society, technology, and environment. So, uh, if we remember our readings uh, in the last uh, <coughs> several weeks, uh, essentially from the beginning of the course, program or pre-program, you know the gadget, the dark side of internet freedom. Uh, you all know and uh, remember now these authors, these uh, titles of the books or articles. And this indeed uh, proves that uh, these people devote, devote, devote to their uh, creative abilities to being critical, uh, to uh, writing also about the critical situation uh, in the world. And uh, designers, uh, obviously, uh, have paid attention to this. Uh, as usual, though, uh, with critical design, just with great many innovation, the very term of critical design and investigation in the subject came from the margins. Uh, the, <coughs> this is the, 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 the quote, which is uh, really an homage to Clive, if it's borrowed from one of his lectures on <coughs> the subject. He says, yes, if the critical is so obvious, then why is the critical in design almost an oxymoron? Indeed, you know, it is not something you would hear at any trade conference at, uh, or many design conferences. When you go to Milan Furniture Fair, a gift fair here in New York, people look and discuss all kinds of design, but the word critical is very mentioned. Uh, Clive Gilmott uh, divides, uh, devises uh, four factors for uh, this situation. Uh, let's look at them uh, one by one. Design is trade or business. This is a conception which has been around for a long time. Design really is supposedly at service of the business. The role of any business is uh, first and foremost to make money. So design has to help businesses to prosper. There is no room for criticism or for anything basically wasting time outside of the business uh, direction of it. The second part, uh, second factor is design as service, narrowly conceived. Design indeed, uh, when it emerged uh, a little over 100 years ago, was conceived as a service profession for industry, helping industry to uh, recreate, uh, uh, modernize uh, technology and objects, and eventually to sell these objects uh, to the public. So there is this still persistent uh, opinion that designer as a service profession, that we're supposed to do what client tells us. We're not really supposed to go beyond the definition of uh, our contract, uh, narrowly in a narrow sense, something signed with the client. 
is a very clear definition of uh, the design assignment. Uh, and being critical and analytical is, does not quite fit very well in the design as service, narrowly conceived. The third factor is design without mind. Uh, that is very unfortunate. The design is not understood, especially in this country, as an intellectual activity. You know, literature, yes. Uh, classical music, yes. Film and art, maybe, probably, yes, intellectual. It is embraced and uh, accepted there. In design, intellectualism is on the margins, maybe for the academia, maybe for some think tanks, think tanks, but not for the uh, practice at large. And this is a preconception which uh, many people in the last uh, 20 years or so tried to overcome. Uh, some of you will see it today in this lecture. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, the very fact that we are having these kind of uh, courses here and these kind of discussions really proves that this design without mind is a preconception to be uh, overcome. And then the fourth factor is design outside of the social or the political. <coughs> Again, it is kind of feeds back to the first three. If it is the third grade, if it's a service, if it's not uh, a thinker, thinking type of profession, then it is positioned outside of the social and political uh, spectrum. It diminishes, uh, it uses its uh, potentiality. And uh, that critical design also uh, try to overcome. So uh, as usual, the notion of critical design came from the outside, from the margins of uh, design profession. This uh, concept uh, uh, belongs really to this person, Anthony Dunn, or Tony Dunn, who is a partner with Dunn and Reddy, and uh, they've been teaching together at Royal College of Arts for quite many years. Uh, he wrote the book, uh, Hearts and Tales, which is in, uh, in fact in your readings uh, for this week. Uh, so you will have a chance to look at some of the uh, parts uh, of his discourse. Further on in the lecture, we actually are going to look at their work. Uh, but for now, I just want to say that uh, he positioned critical design uh, as uh, an instrument to challenge narrow assumptions, preconceptions and givens about the role that products play in everyday life. So his reasoning is like this. Many key ideas in forming mainstream design stem from the early 20th century when design was formulated as a profession. Society has moved on, but design has not. Design still remains in his discourse, according to Dunn, as it was formulated in the early 20th century in the time of modernism. So critical design for them is one of many mutations design is undergoing in an effort to remain relevant. So relevance, it's a responsive position. Design has no choice as to mutate to remain relevant to the complex technological, political, economic, and social changes we are experiencing at the beginning of the 21st century. It is necessary position in this respect. So how do you approach the critical in design? You know, this funny picture I put here is, uh, you know, just, I guess, to make a point that critical in design doesn't mean this existential quest where you just, like, uh, angry at the whole world and uh, try to express that anger, like, uh, scream of Edward Moment. Uh, the biggest uh, direction, uh, the, the only really direction how critical design starts is by question. Uh, this is a new concept in itself. Since the beginning of uh, the profession, design was a designer. A designer was supposed to be an all-knowing figure, uh, somebody who always knew the answers and directions and uh, ready to give consultancy and advice to uh, whoever comes to the designer's help. The idea of uh, unsure designer, questioning designer, was uh, unthinkable. However, uh, the situation is changing. 
uh, much of the publicity was made with the title of uh, the last uh, design triennial at Cooper Hugh. Why design now? Specifically because of that question mark. It doesn't tell you, this book doesn't tell you why design now. It's a question. Why do we do it? What is the point? What are the directions? The Alice Rathard, the New York Times design critic, once uh, about the time of that perennial, uh, wrote an article where she uh, defined design of this present decay as a quest for meaning in a dystopian era. A quest. A quest, if you think about it, has the same root as the word question. You uh, uh, search for something, you request of something by questioning the status quo and moving from there. We're going to uh, now refer to George Perret, who is, uh, uh, was actually uh, a uh, French critic, uh, writer, and a man of letters in Paris in the 1960s and 70s and 80s. And uh, he is a person, uh, he's, uh, by the way, uh, writing is also a part of the readings for this week, so you'll have a chance to write one of his very short essays. He always wrote very short things. He applied his techniques of questioning to the uh, issues and uh, situation of everyday life, of our immediate environment. Uh, and uh, I just give here a short quote uh, from the article, uh, Approaches to What, which you have in your readings. And uh, it gives you a precise idea of what kind of uh, uh, questioning uh, George Perret was uh, interested about. What we need to question is bricks, concrete, glass, our table maps, our utensils, our tools, the way we spend our time, our rhythm. To question what seems to have ceased forever to astonish us. We live, true. We breathe, true. We walk, we open doors. We go down staircases. We sit at the table in order to eat. We lie down in bed in order to sleep. How? Where? When? Why? And here he goes to some directions to look, to learn how to look. Describe your street. Describe another street. Compare. Make an inventory of your pockets, of your bag. Ask yourself about the provenance, the use. What will become of each of the objects you take out? It starts to remind a little bit of our first writing assignment, writing about the objects and describing the objects. Question your teaspoons. Indeed, why are teaspoons? Why do they even exist? Why are they why do they look the way they are? Nobody can what is there under your wallpaper? And this last question, in fact, is, was very interesting to me because it at first looks like just kind of a ridiculous thing to say, what's there under your wallpaper? But then when you start thinking about it, it's almost a quest, a direction for a design project because by thinking about what's under there, you can maybe uh, attempt to redesign wallpaper or redesign the wall itself or the structure of the building perhaps. And this is exactly what happened uh, with uh, uh, another person, another George. Uh, this is George Nelson and this is a much more famous person. It's uh, one of the founding the fathers of American uh, design, primarily known today uh, for the furniture and the clocks he designed for Herman Miller, which are still in production. Uh, but he was also very much interested in uh, the uh, issues of uh, everyday life and how to awaken one's critical perception of the everyday. He wrote this book uh, called How to See, uh, where he pretty much uh, showed similar exercises to George Perret. Uh, how you go on the street, look at the facade of the houses, look at graphics, and create some kind of a creative uh, compilations of uh, those things. And here is the curious story from this book, The Design of Modern Design, uh, which relates a little bit to what we uh, read from George Perret. <coughs> uh, I was looking at the wall, 
And something in my head said, uh, this is George Nelson himself saying, what's inside? How thick is that wall? I thought, who cares how thick the wall is? It's probably four or five inches, go away. And again, the real feeling of a dialogue with this unwanted visitor. What is inside the wall? Hollow tile with plaster on top of it. What else? Nothing. Do you mean there's a vacuum? No, not a vacuum. Air. And air was the trigger. Suddenly, all these unrelated things crashed together. And I realized that the <coughs> essential element in any storage unit or any sort of size was air. Closet has so much air, kitchen cabinet has so much air. And I thought, my goodness, if you took those walls and found more air into them, and they got thicker and thicker until maybe they were 12 inches thick, then you would have hundreds and hundreds of running feet of storage. It didn't take enough inches off the room on either side to be noticed. That was the first of the storage wall. And this is the project which uh, actually made uh, George Nelson famous, the storage wall, which has been you know, in many, many offices all around America and around the world since it was produced in the 1960s. And this incidentally answers the question, what's behind the wallpaper? It could be library. <coughs> Think and reconfigure it in a public way. So uh, to return uh, to general issue of critical design, I'd like to make this uh, kind of compilation. And this is courtesy again uh, from uh, for, well, of Dan and Ravi, but uh, I a little bit uh, simplified it. In order to understand well critical design, we should look first at the qualities of conventional design. So conventional design is, OK, it's a problem solving. This is almost axiom, like somebody would ask you like 10, 15 years ago, what design does, what design does, solves problems. It provides answers, in other words. Design is functional, another axiom. Design has been called functional art, you know, it's, it's, it's about function, it always has to be work, right? It is production oriented. Indeed, uh, most of design is made, uh, or conventional design is made in order to be produced at the factory and companies and offered to the market. It's serving the client. We already talked about that. It's usually not self-generated, but it's a work for somebody, for the client. It is commercial. It makes us buy. It is done for, it's production oriented and it's market oriented. But it doesn't necessarily mean bad, horrible thing, because uh, conventional design is also characterized by innovation. It is supposed to be user-friendly, good and easy to use. It generally sends a positive message. Uh, you know, hard to imagine a negative design. It's bad. It has to be a good, positive style. And uh, fun is a good quality. And ultimately, it's changing the world. It's changing the world to suit us as we are now. Now, if we look at critical design, we will see that it's uh, almost the opposite in every single aspect. Instead of problem solving, it's problem finding. It looks for something which doesn't yet exist, which no client can give you as a problem. It is up to designer, to critical designer, to find problems. Instead of providing answers, therefore, it asks questions. We already talked about the questioning as the major methodology of critical design. Instead of functional, there is a fictional approach. We're going to talk more about this. Uh, it, is, uh, it creates a fiction, a story, a narrative, and it works within the confines of that narrative. Uh, to create the object. <coughs> Therefore, instead of production oriented, the design, the critical design is debate oriented. The objects of critical design often cannot be produced or produced in a very small limited edition. And their true role is to create the debate, the conversation, the discourse in society. And indeed, instead of serving the client, it is serving society as a whole. 
through publishing books, creating exhibitions, you know, presentations like this one, it is addressed to society at large. Now, instead of being commercial, here are the critical insights is intellectual indeed. So one of those factors which slows design down is removed here. It is by declaration intellectual. Instead of making us buy, it makes us think. Innovation is not so bad for critical design, but it is really used more as provocation to, again, challenge us. So instead of user-friendly, it's user-challenging. Sometimes it's too much. Sometimes it's upsetting. Uh, so instead of positive, it could be dark. And we will also, I will show you some examples of this dark design. Uh, however, this darkness so it is to challenge the users, the spectators, in order to create the debate, the provocation, and uh, uh, the debate and the, the, the discourse in society. So fun is rather becomes more of a black humor. And the last one is important. See, instead of changing the world to suit us, they are saying we critical design wants to change us to suit the world. It's a subtle change of the expression, but it's very uh, important. The world is going to change anyway, but we are not going to force it into our often irresponsible way of thinking and acting and doing. Instead, we have to change our habits, our perceptions, and our understanding to suit the world and preserve the world in this respect. Uh, and uh, that is a very important issue here. So uh, I think, um, let's see, let's go next. Uh, yeah. So going from here, uh, uh, I think the best uh, way to uh, understand the truly uh, critical design is, uh, just like any design really, is through uh, case studies. I'm going to show you three uh, different uh, design groups, actually, uh, from different countries and from different times, and very, very different approaches. And it just can give you uh, an idea of what uh, critical design is capable of, and uh, uh, also to see how much fun uh, it could be. So the first one is perhaps the oldest, Ettore uh, Sotsas, this uh, old fellow uh, up there, uh, who actually deceased a few years ago, uh, a famous America, Italian architect and uh, industrial designer in the true sense of the world. Uh, it turns out he was working in the critical vein for many, many years, almost unknowingly for general public. And in 1981, uh, they premiered uh, this uh, very strange furniture collection in Milan. He, he didn't do it alone. He did it with this group called Memphis. And you can see those fellows, uh, boys and girls, some of them are a little bit older than you are. Uh, they were in mostly in their 30s and some maybe even in the late 20s. Uh, many of them who work in uh, Edward's office or just being in the society in Milan or the design uh, scene in Milan, who he personally selected for kind of a unity of vision. And they made this very strange uh, collection. Uh, now, what was that about? Uh, their direction of Memphis was, uh, and the, so the entire provocation of Memphis was against the modern movement as practiced you know, throughout the, most of the 20th century. Uh, this is a diagram from Bauhaus. And in Bauhaus, the building, the architecture, was the center and the ultimate goal of all creative activities. This is how they studied. They studied the basic course and different materials. Then they studied uh, different uh, techniques, industrial design, fashion, everything. And ultimately, the building, this was the capstone. This is how they finished this thing. All furniture, all objects were supposed to be subordinate to architectural space. And if you look at the classic modern interiors, uh, this is from the Corbusier, actually was from the Corbusier, you would see that my, a lot of furniture is not even there. Many design typologists, you know, they used to be wardrobes, right? In modern architecture, it became walk-in closet, built into architecture. 
the praying acres built in under the window it used to be a big stove, you know, as an object. Uh, in fact, the chair, uh, the tables, the shelving, the beds even, they're all built in, only chairs, you know, in the top, uh, uh, in this uh, top photograph. And here in the bottom, even chair was replaced by this stool, box-like stool, which could be, you know, uh, stored in there, so nothing really deters from uh, perception of architecture as things. So here comes Memphis, and they create furniture like this. So this is complete opposite. It's this thing is not going to disappear in an interior. It rather creates the space around itself. Uh, it is. It uses a lot of uh, techniques to create itself. First of all, it's uh, very very big and aggressive. Secondly, it's colorful in the sense that not just one color which can sort of fit. You know, like I want blue. And fit this my interior. No, this is all colors. It's definitely going to clash. No matter what interior you're going to put, it's going to clash. Then it is anthropomorphic. It all, many of their furniture looks like kind of like a human being, like a big sumo wrestler or some kind of a creature. And that also makes, you know, you pay attention. So this idea of uh, like this extremely aggressive and active design was a uh, uh, direction of uh, Memphis group. From the other hand, they were architects by education. Uh, Ettore, definitely, and most of the other members. So they used uh, kind of their architectonic language to create their pieces. But this was a different. It was not an architecture of the space. It's like as if they were building another building inside of a uh, uh, of a uh, given space. So the closet becomes uh, some kind of architectural composition. You know, the credenza has like almost like a cityscape on top of it. And even the tiny little uh, uh, side table is like a temple. Uh, everything is very heavy also. Uh, and this is a very, it's a part of that monumentality which they wanted to do. At the same time, uh, there was this uh, brilliant uh, rethinking of what the furniture can be in an iconic sense, you know? As we used to talk, it's like a class example, like every chair, you know, you, there's no uh, definition, there's no law about the chair being a chair. This is a perfect proof, you know, they can rethink a chair completely as a some simple stool with this kind of an orbit of planets around it. And yet, at the same time, this is uh, by Michele Luki, it is very comfortable, uh, in effect, one of the most best selling pieces from Memphis, very comfortable chair with the back and armrests and so on. Uh, then the idea of the active surface, that the surface of an object is not uh, some residual thing, you know, like for instance in this uh, uh, podium here, the surface is invisible, we do not see it, you know. This object is designed in order to disappear, in order to not be seen. Here, not only the objects were aggressive or in this case cute and kind of zoomorphic, uh, like an animal, some running around, but also the surface was very active. And uh, the surface often clashed with the form of the shape, uh, with the shape, you know, to kind of bring this energy and dynamism even further. And these are, by the way, all uh, plastic laminates. So this is, uh, they were quite concerned about democratization of their design. They didn't use ever uh, very expensive uh, <coughs> materials, bronze, marble, or whatever. This was uh, considered like a two bourgeois. They wanted to create the effort with simple uh, economical stuff. Uh, the idea that the pattern and the decoration can essentially create an object, and this is the so-called uh, chair of Proust, of Marcel Proust by Mendini, which is just a normal 19th century re-edition piece. In Italy, they still produce you know, thousands of these for various, you know, homes, uh, not even very expensive. So he did cover it completely with this uh, pointless technique to turn into something completely different from the original uh, thing, without abandoning the shape of this uh, period, the uh, 19th century chair, it turned it into avant-garde. So the expansion again, what the pattern, what decoration can do. And 
even you know with uh, every single object uh, with ceramics glass silverware you can see how things were reinvented uh, how forms were so unusual strange over really to many of our eyes now uh, because this is the 19 early 80s uh, now we are kind of trained in the perception of more likeness and all this but it's a very powerful thing. The decoration, you know, this was a time where the nuclear, uh, you know, anti-nuclear movement was being, like now we talk about global warming. At the time, people were talk, talking about, you know, eliminating threat of the nuclear weapons and all that. This is their response, you know, to drunk dudes, you know, drinking, you know, beer on the beach and the nuclear bomb is, you know, falling back there. So they kind of irreverent punk, if you wish. And they, infer, you know, influenced the, if any lasting influence uh, for Memphis was in the so-called new wave, the, the rock music, the performance, uh, the art of the 1980s. Uh, so what happened to Memphis? This is the quote from Eto Isotzes. He says, uh, I think that every strong idea lasts a very short time. Because strong ideas are strong, they cannot be developed. They are what they are. They come down like a pulse of light. They are there and then finito. The market asked us to make more furniture, but that's when we had to say no, because we had never wanted to make anything that could be sellable. So the group collectively decided to split up. Everyone went back to life. Uh, an interesting note, uh, and this is a very much uh, quality of, uh, like several qualities of critical design are here in these uh, short relations of Sotsas. You know, they said no because they didn't want to make anything sellable, because the minute it becomes sellable and commercial, it stops being critical, because the market asked us. They didn't want the market to ask them anything. They wanted to say what they wanted to do. And after first shock, the market accepted this wild stuff, little by little. And that's when they stopped. So critical design is uh, often uh, something fleeting, something which cannot, by definition, last for a long time, especially if it is successful. OK. Uh, case study number two. Study number two is uh, uh, Tony Dunn and Fiona Rabbi, the uh, creators, if you wish, of uh, uh, critical design, uh, who basically coined that term and made it uh, publicly acceptable. And you can see right away that this is uh, there are very different uh, objects here from what you've seen before. It's like a hugging pillow in the shape of an uh, atomic bomb explosion. It's a very early project of them before they really did anything. Or this, uh, uh, you know, this thing for blood transfusions, which is uh, shaped in like a cute little teddy bear, kind of, uh, I guess, uh, create a more friendly image of this uh, rather horrifying device, which we would rather never see in our lives. But if we have to, at least we see that. Uh, they developed, uh, uh, Dutton and Reby, uh, developed uh, this concept of design fictions. And that is something which we need to pause uh, on a little bit. Uh, because this, is, uh, this expression uh, you hear quite many times in uh, many different uh, readings. And uh, it is also been quite a bit misunderstood. Uh, what they are saying is that we are very interested in the difference between think fictional functions and functional fictions. Okay, it's a little bit of a tongue twister here, but what is that supposed to mean? Fictional functions think and functional fictions. So the first one, fictional functions, is what we get every day. 
functional products, but they really meet only fictional needs. The mobile phone, you know, we do not need and we don't use really half of the functions, the apps which it offers us. Uh, in uh, if you look at uh, like uh, I don't know remote control for TV, there are so many possibilities there. What you can do, which nobody but nobody ever does. And yet it's there. Why? It is created in order to give like some perceived value to maybe ask for more money for the object. So the function itself or the object, they become fiction, it's a gimmick. That's a good word to explain fictional functions. A lot of design technological designs today they are full of gimmicks, which is in other words the functions which are not really needed. What are Dana Reddy saying, on the other hand, that many of our projects we would describe as functional fictions. So they are fictions, like the literature. And in fact, the science fiction is the very best approximation here. The science fiction is a story which exists somewhere, just like a literature, but it's a science fiction. It's based on some kind of a scientific knowledge, at least really. So they are saying they are objects, they exist in a fictional world, but they don't exist as real products, but they are prototypes, they are semi-real. These fictions are highly functional in the sense that they address, although often intellectual, uh, uh, they, they, need, they need they address this uh, Dunnegrave's objects are real and genuine, even though intellectual. Okay, well, get back to this when we look at some of the apologies. Uh, I chose just a few of them. Uh, this was uh, a, actually a short movie, but uh, it's not possible to access it here, I found out. But we're going to just look at this as a slide, uh, separate slide images. This is a relatively new project, and uh, some of you may have seen it in one of our readings in the exhibition here at MoMA. Uh, it was called Emotional Robots. So here, what's the fiction here? They are saying, okay, one day in the future, robots will do everything for us. It's a dream that refuses to go away, but how will we interact with them? What new interdependencies and relationships will emerge in relation to different levels of robots' intelligence? So this collection is, we, we traditionally, from the functional point of view, robots are supposed just to do things for us basically be like invisible, you know, the same way as a refrigerator works or the heating in our building just heats us and we don't want to even like think about it. But they are saying if robots are going to be so intellectual, if we, you know, are going to rely on them so much, then maybe we should somehow start relating to them differently, more like a, you know, pets perhaps. And uh, here, I wish we could see it in motion because this project is very interactive, but essentially uh, uh, the first robot is the ring, and uh, this uh, ring is afraid of, of uh, electromagnetic waves which exist in the space. Uh, this is uh, when you read the Hertz and Tales, you would uh, understand it a little bit better. You know, you probably hear uh, that how the cell phones are sometimes said they're dangerous, they can affect our brains because of the waves which are going on. And uh, these waves really go from uh, and emulate from much of technology. Nobody quite uh, proven that it's dangerous to people, but there is some disquiet about it. So this machine, this robot, the ring, is very much uh, afraid of those waves. And it positions itself always in a space where there's the least interference of the waves. And therefore, the space inside of the ring is the safest space in any given room. Uh, so the person can actually go there, and the owner can go there and relax and be like kind of a safe, at least uh, psychologically, from those sorts of waves, like uh, in, in the space. Uh, the Sentinel is, uh, okay, I wish I remembered the story very well. Uh, the Sentinel is uh, that square, square strange thing, and it is very much unsure like uh, who the proper owner is. 
uh, wolf is, is proper owner, so you have to look, it has these two eyes in that uh, uh, brown, uh, in, in that wooden uh, thing on the top, and the owner has to look him in the eyes, he scans your eyes, only then uh, he understands that uh, you're okay, you're his owner, and then he can do whatever is uh, the, the function or he can need to be done. The neurotic one is the one which, uh, uh, like, uh, uh, just uh, goes crazy with all the interferences uh, in the space. And uh, whenever there's a noise, uh, a light change of light, or somebody comes in, it has many eyes, the sensors, it rolls around like crazy and uh, kind of reflects to any space, uh, uh, any environmental change in space, and then finally, like, settles down. And then there is this the needy one uh, that is like uh, the famous. Uh, it has to be, you know, it cannot move really. Uh, it has it's the smartest one of all. You know, it has this big brain, and this is like a screen where great much information, uh, much information going to uh, be stored and also expressed to the owner. But he cannot move, and he really wants to move. So the owner has to. Uh, there is this little. Uh, cord there, the owner has to move it around like a little uh, toy on wheels, you know, always busy. And then this is the only way, you know, to interact with that, uh, with that robot. So, you can see, this is a different fiction of what the objects could be. Uh, here we will go to another, even more radical perhaps, and actually, as you will see now, as the approaches progress in time, they become more and more fictional. In fact, and one would say less and less uh, uh, rooted in reality as we understand it today. Uh, designed for an overpopulated planet is a project of 2009. It was also shown at MoMA, I believe. And here the concept is that uh, uh, eventually uh, the planet, uh, our planet becomes overpopulated. Uh, there will be tremendous shortages of food. It would be just simply impossible to feed all the uh, people on Earth. So the, uh, the system, the digestive system of uh, people will also be changed in addition to the digestive system which we uh, you know, have now naturally. Uh, there will be an additional things which would be possible to buy and kind of implant in the body which would help us to digest things which uh, normally people can. So this is uh, the foragers, it's designed for this overpopulated planet. So these are the foragers which eat uh, algae. Uh, so they can sit like around the lake or pond and uh, you know, this, this green stuff is not just a device, but it's an extension of uh, our digestive system. At the same time, of course, it becomes a little bit of a fashion statement like this kind of uh, overall weirdness of it. Uh, uh, here you see this, uh, I think I missed one. Okay, so. Yeah. Uh, so here are the different devices for foragers. Uh, and uh, the tube ones allow, allow you to eat leaves and branches of trees, the same way as giraffes, let's say, do. It will be possible to digest this thing as they go down those tubes. Uh, and this is for algae and uh, some other things. Okay. Uh, the third project, which is uh, the newest one, which in fact was done only a few months ago, uh, right now I'm pleased to present it in the Design Museum in London, called United Micro Kingdoms. Design fiction. You see? Design fiction again. Uh, here is the, uh, the uh, they kind of uh, reinterpret instead of the United Kingdom as it is as it exists now, it's divided into four big uh, regions. It's divided into different regions, and uh, it's kind of like they look at this grid, uh, which spans uh, the whole development of the society from left uh, wing to right wing, and from authoritarian kind of uh, society with a lot of control to libertarian, uh, just the people who are just don't want to be ruled or governed by anybody. Uh, 
like anarchists. Uh, and they sketched out four different uh, visions of, uh, of societies which can exist in this uh, micro kingdom. So digitarians are, as you can see, they are right wing and they are also, they like uh, control. They are also very technological. And uh, this is uh, their world. They concentrated uh, actually in this, uh, in this project on the vehicles. Uh, the transportation was kind of a theme, on the riding theme. So what kind of cars, what kind of vehicles would these four different uh, categories of people uh, uh, would drive? So for digitarians, uh, there are these digi-cars. Uh, this is like the space there is efficiency. And their whole country is like essentially like a tarmac covered with asphalt. And uh, they uh, get in this car, it's just a standing room. The cars are self-driving something that's already being uh, actually researched uh, and uh, developed uh, today, so that's a possibility. But here there's only a little curve. You can't even sit down because the space is too precious. On the other hand, the car is connected uh, to like everything, you know, from uh, uh, internet to stock market calls to whatever information needs to be uh, uh, accessible to people as they drive. And this is like a landscape of, uh, of digitarians. Uh, this is like their city, which essentially becomes like an enormous highway. There's the different marks and they just move like this. The uh, bioliberals, which are on the other end of the spectrum, as you can see, they are left wing and live at the end. So this would be like the hippies. People who live in like Woodstock, they just don't want to bother with anything. At the same time, they are very environmentally, of course, uh, conscious. So here, as you can see, they are uh, they create these bio cars. So these are things which are powered by uh, natural gases, uh, the compost, uh, the, I think even the gases which come from people, you know. Uh, and uh, the skin and everything is made of uh, uh, like natural skin and organic. It's uh, plastic. It's like organic cellulose based. And uh, yeah, this is how uh, their vehicles are. They're very, very slow. And then the third one, the anarcho evolutionists, let's see where they are located. You see, they are right. And they are right wing. And they are libertarians, so they don't like authority. So they'll be equivalent of the Tea Party <laughs> here in America, kind of people. Just like government leave us alone. Uh, and they are, you see, they decided to evolve themselves. They don't drive at all, I think. And uh, instead, you know, they, they use only uh, natural vehicles like bicycle and uh, balloons. So some people who drive bicycle all the time develop this incredible uh, feet muscles that uh, this dude here. And then these guys who travel on air balloons, they are very willow and light and uh, kind of uh, can operate all those uh, sails, uh, air sails. And even their animals are different. I think this video is called ox. It's a mixture of horse and the ox. You know, so you can ride it, but you all, it also provides you with meat kind of things like that. Uh, uh, so, yeah. So, curious thing about this approach is that these are the futures which are not especially nice. You know? We don't really want any of these things to come through, if you think about it. None of these four kingdoms or foragers who eat leaves, you know, with this like long tubes. We don't really want this to happen. So very often the, the questioning and the critique of uh, uh, Dan Revy was like, why are you proposing this horrendous stuff? You know, isn't it a bit dark? You know, your vision and your whole body of work. So they are saying one of the critical design's roles is to question the limited range of emotional and psychological experiences offered through design products. Design is assumed to only make things nice. 
It's as though all designers have taken an unspoken Hippocratic oath. That's for medicine, you know, the Hippocratic oath is that never to harm the patient, right? So they, as if you know, designers also say, we can never harm or upset you know, our client, good for pain. Like, wow. This, they say, limits and prevents us from fully engaging with and designing for the complexities of human nature, which, of course, is not always nice. <laughs> and uh, you will see there later in uh, my own work, uh, this very much uh, is uh, an issue which I personally have with, uh, with design today, that you know the, the tragedy, the upsetting, the horrific things are automatically excluded from the field. There are great many movies or literature where films or books or theater which makes us cry. You know, people literally cry hysterically when they see, it, and then they love it. Still. Quite the opposite, they go back when the film is finished. It was amazing. It's crying the whole time. Imagine like uh, the same about design. You know, design cannot upset. But why? Why not? Exactly. You know, design, if uh, conceived in a critical and intellectual way, should be able to address all kinds of emotions, as Dan Berg said. And therefore, uh, it uh, can also should sometimes be uncomfortable, physically, but specifically you know, emotionally. Okay, so now, uh, the case study number three is your stupid, and in fact, to be a friend is my partners, my studio, which I run with uh, my wife and long time partner, Lauren. And these projects uh, I'm going to show, they span uh, from the 1990s. Uh, you're looking at this book, Curious Poem, which really takes its title. Uh, some of you, especially the Native American, American born here, would know where it comes from. It's a Curious George, of course, that little monkey which always plays and kind of provokes things in his immediate environments, experiments with everything, uh, tries to find better ways to do things, and as a result, always gets in trouble. So I felt that this was a great, perfect like, mirror for designers' life, that we all should be like Curious George here in our world. Uh, and uh, this specific uh, projects I want to show you are devoted, uh, devoted to the genre of souvenirs. And this is something which is uh, quite uh, important for my studio. We've been working for almost 20 years on and off, obviously, on uh, this uh, general uh, genre. Some of the writings, uh, among the writings, there is an article for Culture Sake, which I wrote many years ago, and uh, it is included that it will give you a certain insight about this. But just to summarize uh, what I started to say, it is important to understand that uh, the souvenirs are related uh, very much to uh, the business of tourism, to the industry of tourism, rather. It's now, it's been uh, already uh, for quite a few years that it's been recognized that the tourism in a worldwide scale is the largest world industry today. It generates most, in terms of the billions of dollars, entire <coughs> countries, small countries, entirely live off profits of tourism. But even the big countries, the big cities like New York City, in fact, profits uh, very handsomely from the continuous influx of tourists. Uh, and we're talking about know, hotels, restaurants, entertainment, everything is included in that industry. Yeah? Now, arguably, the uh, souvenir is, uh, is a primary object related to tourism industry because it's aimed at tourists who buy it, who bring it home. It's a continuous exchange of this. Uh, souvenir uh, item. So if, if souvenirs are so important, if they are connected to the largest industry in the world, why are they still ostracized uh, by uh, the industry as uh, some kind of uh, useless knickknacks, gimmicks, charchkas, a uh, great many words to, you know, uh, denigrate and like put down the souvenirs. Uh, and in 
fact, uh, hardly ever like a famous designers uh, accepted a commission to design souvenirs, or very rarely that the all subject of souvenirs is uh, offered as a sub as a assignment in design school or the subject of a conference. Until very recently, there hardly been any books. Uh, like, and in fact, still, there is not a definitive book about history and uh, uh, the development of souvenirs. So how do you explain that? Uh, that is what originally attracted my attention to this project typology of the souvenir. But in addition to that, there was also something else. Uh, you know, put aside all the big words about uh, business of tourism, etc., and just look at uh, you know your own home, or when you, especially when you go visit your parents, uh, and I bet if not your own apartment, that your parents' apartment would have something like this. Somewhere there is a corner where there are these strange objects which are accumulated over many years. Something's bought somewhere, uh, something some friends uh, or relatives bought you, and it's just been part of those shelves. Many of these things are not even useful in any conventional sense of the world. They're not really functional. And yet, also they don't often have any like true value. They could be quite cheap things. And yet they're kept for many years. They are become sometimes for lifetime. They become these keepsakes. So it interested me also very much how this uh, uh, simple, mute, sort of things are capable to carry all these emotions and uh, uh, capable to be kept for uh, many, many years and even passed from uh, people to, uh, from one generation to another. Like, what is it in these objects that uh, makes us uh, attracted to them? And then, of course, we live in a very different world now. It's not the souvenirs becomes uh, almost by extension a manifestation of uh, one's uh, national identity and religious identity. And uh, people are not hiding these things anymore. They are not writing to try to hide where they came from. These are images from uh, New York City taxi cabs. And you can see right away, you know, one guy has these Japanese dolls, and the other, probably Italian, has these religious uh, uh, figurines. Uh, but it's immediately clear where these people come from, what they stand for, and what kind of identity they try to uh, project and express. And again, this identity is expressed in these tiny little seemingly useless uh, things. So, uh, thinking about it, writing about it, eventually, of course, like every designer, we moved on to making those things. And this project was uh, called originally the Souvenirs for the End of the Century. Uh, it, is, uh, it was done in uh, 1998, as you can see, uh, in time for the millennium, the uh, forthcoming millennium. At the time, it seemed that the millennium was a big event. It turned out to be a non-event completely. <laughs> so I'm sorry like now to like, try to uh, still uh, push it forward, but it seemed that every creative individual should respond somehow to this momentous uh, event, a moment in human history. And we thought, okay, look, well, uh, events, historical events are usually marked uh, with souvenirs, so why don't we make souvenirs for the end of the century? And uh, there were you know, so this idea of a tragic souvenirs of course came because the 20th century was not exactly a very happy one. Uh, there were terrible world wars, there was uh, anxiety, millions of people who died, etc. Et uh, there were several lines there in the, in the collection, uh, in the catalog, but the most uh, famous and long-lasting was this one called Buildings of Disaster. And this primarily refers to uh, the big uh, tragic events uh, which took place in the 20th century. Now, many people at the time were really shocked at how can you make souvenirs about a disaster. Uh, we are showing here, you know, that actually there are a lot of presidents, long history of presidents. This is a souvenir from uh, uh, the, a Cuban souvenir from 
from the Bay of Pigs, where they uh, 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 rejected the, uh, defended, you know, themselves uh, against the American invasion. And that uh, land is offered there as a Sunni, the piece of the uh, piece of Berlin Wall uh, here, which uh, you can still buy on eBay. A lot of them are fake even now because the real wall is already almost finished. We can't cheap on it anymore. Uh, but still, you know, it's available. For this uh, mug operation Desert Storm, which I myself bought in the state of New York uh, when there was supposedly a great victory in that war. Um, but, uh, you know, our souvenirs are different in one important uh, respect. They are also about architecture. Uh, this, uh, they celebrate buildings, and these buildings would uh, normally be completely uh, anonymous. We would not even know or ever even like recognize them if not for tragedy that took place in their place. So here you see the, uh, the Texas School Book Depository of Dallas, uh, just a warehouse building from where J.F. Kennedy was shot. This is the Oklahoma City Federal Building, it was built in 1995, a terrible event, you know, uh, in American history. And even this, like, uh, a wretched little shack, uh, which is a Unabomber's house, for where, where he could talk with his bombs and send them to uh, various uh, technologically advanced uh, people around the United States. So these buildings are not, uh, they form a different history of architecture, if you wish. It's, they wouldn't be in a normal history of architecture, but they are iconic and immediately recognized. It's a populist history of architecture. It's a, something that we attach to them because of the emotional connection, not because of their uh, architectural sport and merit. And even the issue of, uh, you know, uh, political <laughs> disaster, the Watergate was involved. And this, the OJ car chase, was made by, you know, by public demand because we had, when the first catalog came out and it continued, we had many, many letters from people. They, they said that the history of 20th century would not be complete without this memorizing that event, uh, even though it's strictly speaking not a building. Uh, now, I'm showing sure this thing here. This, uh, you know, this uh, Washington Monument, uh, just as a curious insight, that very often the makers of miniature building add some extraneous function to them. It's a thermometer, or it's a panhole, or it's an eraser, uh, a screw, you know, cork screw. There are many variations. For me, the function of these buildings is determined in a very different uh, way. We used to call, uh, I used to come with this expression called fuzzy function. It's fuzzy because it is unclear, because these buildings fulfill an immaterial need. That need is uh, of kind of emotional connection. And uh, ultimately, this need is unclear because everybody has their own purpose. Why they buy this, what they do with it, and what kind of emotions or connection they have with these things, some for fun and some for more, uh, perhaps much more serious issues. And all these became very clear eventually because of this. Uh, it so happened that uh, in the first uh, edition of uh, the souvenirs, in 1998, this building was made. Uh, so way before September 11. Why? Because there was another bombing in the uh, World Trade Center, now almost forgotten. But in, sometime in 1993, there was an explosion, terrorist uh, attack, another explosion set in the garage where some six people died, and it was a very, very big also news at the time. So this was made and offered in the catalog. By the time of uh, 2001, as a matter of fact, the catalog was finished because it was supposed to last only through the millennium. It was a momentous event, just like Memphis, you know, with the Sonsas. We didn't try to continue it forever. It was just a sink to mark the event and then to move on. Um, 
And when September 11 happened, I mean, in my book, it's uh, written there that uh, almost one of the first calls I got on uh, September 11 uh, on the phone was from somebody who asked if they can buy this. I completely freaked out and, in fact, hang out the phone and, uh, because I thought it was some kind of a black sick joke or something. But then more calls like this came, and also some email requests, and ultimately people whose offices were in the towers, uh, and obviously people who survived, but they lost you know, everything, uh, they wrote to me and they said they really very much wanted this, if possible. Uh, how can you say no to this kind of requests? Obviously there was this emotional need for the people to have this uh, Soviet Union. Something what in the psychological terms is sometimes called a container. Uh, so the summary where you can put your emotions and your anger and kind of lock it there. But it didn't maybe put it away. Even. And uh, so, but this were not even available. So after much soul searching, uh, we continue, we produced the the September 11 edition. Uh, this was a partially already charity project also. The project was meant to uh, funds of, uh, of the September 11. And it was a limited edition also. It was all in the past. And after that, you know, this project continued in a way. Uh, because uh, it became clear that uh, it became sort of slightly different uh, character of this project. It became almost like uh, writing uh, chronicles of history, and whatever ter terrible things happened, we would mark that event with still another building and kind of add it uh, to the collection. This is a New Orleans uh, Superdome, in itself quite old uh, piece now. Right now. Um, so there was, of course, a lot of controversy about these things. Uh, many people uh, objected to them in terms of grounds of taste, saying that this is key. Some people who objected on the grounds of uh, the years of the from people's, uh, you know, belief and tragedy. But this is, again, you know, uh, the answer to this was uh, something that we you know, already discussed a bit with uh, regards of the Dun and Rag, the idea that design is not supposed to be only a message of the thing, and it is acceptable to write books, make films, uh, make art about these tragic events, therefore it must be acceptable also to produce design objects and sell them. This is uh, something we try to uh, advocate, and ultimately it has been accepted by the public and by the critics. Now, many people who liked these, uh, these pieces, you know, they uh, elected them, they perceived them as art, as sculptures, little sculptures, which they uh, can put you know, together with other artworks they might possibly have. To us, this was never art. And I very consciously avoided have them exhibited in art museums or art galleries where they would sit together with paintings and sculptures. For us, it was always objects of design. How is it designed? Yes, okay, you cannot brush your teeth with it, you cannot, well, maybe you can't hammer nails with it, but it's not really advisable. So it's not functional, but the function is different. And ultimately, it is supposed to be in your everyday environment. You're supposed to handle these things, take it, touch it, keep it on your desk, you know, move it around. It becomes part of your environment. And this is very much uh, is the issue also with much of the Dun and Ravi stuff. And here is one more question uh, directed to them uh, specifically. But isn't it hard talking about what they were doing about those strange figurines and those robots which look like sculptures and so on? They're saying it's definitely not art. It might borrow heavily from art in terms of the methods and approaches, but that's it. We expect art to be shocking and extreme. Critical design needs to be closer to the everyday. That's where its power to disturb comes from. Yes, it's not for the walls. 
It's not for the collection. It's not supposed to have do not touch sign. It is supposed to be here within our immediate environment, is touched, handled, and therefore it is even more disturbing. Okay, um, moving to an end. Uh, the, and one more project, this is one more project from our studio, a newer project, uh, something that uh, we've done in 2007. The project is Babel Blocks, and it's also a project, a souvenir project. It's a souvenir of New York, of New York City. A very different kind of souvenir. Like what is really famous about, like really unique about New York City. Ultimately, it's not the building, it's not the Empire State not Central Park, not the Olga. It's the people, people on the streets. A great many foreigners who I question about this always say that the crowds are just incredible in the South. Oh my God, everybody looks different in different parts of the world all together. It became clear that that was essentially the essence of uh, New York City. Was. So the idea was to create these figures, the characters, of different uh, tribes, if you wish, different people which inhabit the streets of New York City. Now, how do you choose who and how and where, what? Uh, the decision was made to concentrate on religion, on different religions. That seemed timely at the moment, and still is, because the religion is a hot issue in the world right now. The, different, the difference of religions are, that's the hot issue. All the wars in all the ethnic strife now is on that ground. People fight because of their religions. Uh, we wanted to show that, uh, you know, of course the, the message of our project is the one of peace and tolerance and understanding. You know, different people have different outfits, they have different costumes and they have different hats. And therefore, they feel very differently and sometimes hostile to each other. But ultimately, they're all made of the same block. You can see the shape of all these people is exactly the same. So we're all the same deep inside. We're all together. Um, we should somehow find a way to be together as a bunch of identical blocks. Or so if we can build anything for Babel, instead of for the word Babel, sorry, the Tower of Babel. Uh, it was decided also at one point, because we also were thinking about how to make them out of which material to be whatever, you know, porcelain or rubber, decided to make these things uh, out of wood, because uh, that referred to this uh, experiments from, you know, by masters of uh, 20th, American masters of 20th century. The Hinses did wood toys, and specifically Alexander Gerard in the 1960s made a big collection of wooden toys uh, for his car home, and then eventually it was produced, <coughs> now produced by Vitra, I believe. Uh, there is a big difference here, you can see right away. For Gerard in the 60s, it was possible to create a collection of toys which were just uh, visually very exciting and exuberant, almost like the Day of the Dead or Halloween parade, you know, like real, just weird characters. Uh, now, we felt that was not enough. There has to be social content into this. Not just funky looking people. They have to stand for some ideas. So our figures are indeed the bearers of different religions and uh, also different attitudes in life. So these figures, uh, our figures rather, uh, they have, you know, they, they, their heads are turning like this. Uh, and uh, as we were making them and experimenting, uh, the idea came to start uh, make, making this animation, the stop motion animations. And uh, that is also very much a tradition, of course, of the Gerard and Eames especially. You all know the Eames movies. Not just the power of them, but the other, which they did with toys and that. So this is again kind of a throw back to what we teams do with these toys. And as uh, we proceeded with making these movies, they, uh, they, they, the fact of making them became almost as important as the project itself. 
I'm going to show you now. Uh, I'm going to show you now a bunch of.
uh, you can get them uh, actually on YouTube and see the whole the whole thing about, about halfway through only. Uh, yeah, they. Um, so this project was very successful uh, uh, in the sense that it was uh, critically acclaimed and it was accepted into the Museum of Modern Art exhibition, Elastic Mind, and then eventually into the permanent uh, design collection. Uh, but for us, again, remember that question, but is it art? You know, it is not enough to be in the MoMA. You know? It has to be a product available people uh, in order to qualify as design and uh, so after all that uh, we took a very difficult challenge of actually producing these things uh, and this is a set uh, of first five characters which are based uh, on the Lower East Side the area where we live in and uh, these are produced in China uh, this you know the real factory in several thousand sets like this were made. And these were, in fact, available, still are even on our website. And they were sold quite a lot uh, at the, around the city in many design stores at the time when uh, this project uh, was new. So it becomes, again, a piece which people can play with, interact with, uh, have on their desks, or whatever they want to do. And then uh, at the time, you know, there was also each one uh, uh, had this address, uh, internet address, it was in MySpace, believe it or not, but uh, the Facebook was in, in infancy in those years, in uh, 2008. Just so recently, but it's not hardly anybody used it. MySpace was the same. So each one of these guys had this uh, website, MySpace, and some people actually responded. Uh, uh, Lauren, of course, you know, she was the one who was answering for that. But the idea that even these uh, basically little pieces of wood could have their own web pages and uh, generate some fans and all that, that seemed like very funny to me at the time. Uh, the controversy was not, by the way, uh, in this project, even though very cute, it was not controversy free. Uh, and one thing which uh, you were criticized with uh, was the stereotype that we show people how, like, these are stereotypes, you know, the funny guys dancing, you know, the great dance, the Jew goes, you know, ahead of the line. Why are we saying, you know, doing all these things which are not so nice? But precisely that's why, to pay, to make people aware of stereotypes. Because these, after all, are just find these little good toys, and they'll be perceived the ills of society while we look at them, then maybe we could question the, the real thing and how we relate uh, to our neighbors, real people. So again, you know, that is a part of the critical design, not to shy away and rather sharpen uh, the controversial element there and uh, with the idea of generate that debate as a necessary component of it. And this is just a curious uh, footnote, because you never know how projects develop. So just uh, very recently, we actually won a competition to make this uh, so-called the history wall. And this is going to be on Delancey Street, uh, uh, right at the entrance to the Williamsburg Bridge. And these characters would be like, they are right now almost like eight feet tall. And they would be kind of a greeting people coming into Manhattan. New characters have been developed actually for this wall. The ones which are particularly important for the West Side and maybe a little bit uh, less uh, exaggerated. Uh, but uh, yeah, check out for this opening. It should be built uh, probably now sometime early spring. And we'll, we'll see it next time. Both of you. Um, so, what happens to critical design? Uh, and I just wanted to finish this uh, lecture with this one little uh, uh, quote again from Dan and Ravi. Uh, a danger for critical design, they say, is that it ends up as a form of sophisticated design entertainment. 90% humor, 10% critique. 
and you know just maybe it's already happening, you know, a little bit with the coaches that I show you. It's kind of a more funny than they are uh, challenging. And they say that it needs to avoid this situation. The critical design, in order to survive and to be relevant, it needs to avoid this situation by identifying and engaging with complex and challenging issues. Future will benefit from its more gritty view of human nature and ability to make abstract issues tangible. Thank you.